Well, hello there, everybody. Hi, it is Jason with Green Country Agriculture back again with another Wednesday live stream permaculture deep dive. How's everybody doing out there tonight? Mary loses all the pieces. <laughs> I think we have two different risk board games sitting up on a, on a shelf over here in the living room that are both missing about half their pieces. You put them both together and you actually have a full set. Oh, all right. Let's see what's going on out there. Okay, I see, I see lurkers. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right, well, we got two people. I guess it's time to get started. So you may have noticed there's some minor changes. I'm wearing, um, I'm wearing this. This is the Green Country Agroforestry official t-shirt from the website. Woohoo. So we have those in now. And if you look down at the bottom of chat, if you look down at the bottom of the chat, you may see a little something unusual there. There's like a little, a little dollar sign. <laughs> Mark's not late. Yes, it's true. We got monetized. Isn't that wonderful? Yay. <clears throat> Amy is on time. Yay. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a good thing you guys are here because I'm getting ready to start. Uh, today's today's show is enemies and allies, which is all about trying to find ways to use the natural predators that exist in nature to help us out in the garden. And I'm going to go ahead and bring up a picture here. Yes, welcome to the Penny Pinchers. <laughs> all right, so they may be small, but don't but don't dis discount them. Insects. Insects have a total mass of about 1 billion metric tons on planet Earth. That's half the mass of all animal life on Earth. So they're out there. They outnumber us, obviously. They outweigh us. And uh, we're fighting this war against insects all the time. But uh, let's be honest with ourselves. It's it's more of a holding action than a, than actually a war that we're winning, and in a lot of cases we're losing the fight. So it might be a good time to take a step back and uh, reassess our strategy, and maybe see if we can find some allies to help us out. Now, all of you people that were here last week should be familiar with that picture that I've got up there on the screen. That is, if I can move the pointer around here, some aphids on a allium flower with a bunch of ants surrounding it here. And the ants are farming the aphids. The aphids are sucking the juices out of the out of the stem of the plant, producing honeydew, which the ants are drinking up because the ants love it. And the ants protect the aphids because the aphids don't really have much of a defense of their own. Number one enemy of aphids is, well, these guys. And this one here is a, uh, is a ladybug larva that is busy eating what looks like oh, stink beetles, I think. Stick bugs, but the ladybugs and ladybug larvae like eating aphids too. So if the ants try to protect them, and that's where we got our little cover shot here. Hurrah! The farm is saved. The ants have successfully brought down the fearsome beast, the ladybug larva. So they're doing their job, protecting their their aphids, their little cows, from the predator. In this case, the ladybug. But what if we could do something to give the ladybug some help? Let me get back up here. What if we could do something to give the ladybug some help? The place where all this drama is taking place is up here in the herbaceous layer, and sometimes you end up in the fruit trees as well, but up here in the, in the herbaceous layer where this ladybug larva and the ladybugs are running around where the aphids are eating the aphids. The cat escaped from the bedroom. Oh, no. <laughs> She's in the heat. I'm sorry, guys. Cat. Run off. Ah. Don't mean I have to throw things at you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but the ants here are the, are the interesting thing. All right. You may have heard somebody talking in, in, in tactical circles about the importance of controlling the high ground. And a lot of people think up here that, that that means you have to occupy the high ground. If you're up here on the high ground, you're looking down at the surrounding territory, you can see what's going on and you can attack from the high ground. That seems to make sense, but it's important to know that there's a difference between occupying high ground and actually controlling the high ground. And this is where it's important. The herbaceous layers in the high ground 
But where did the ants live? They live down in the soil. So for the ants to get up to the herbaceous layer to do anything about the ladybugs, they have to travel across the ground. And that's where we have the opportunity to do something about them. Let me introduce you to our friend, the lizard. Now, I don't know what kind of lizard this is. Uh, I wear a lot of hats. I'm not a herpetologist. I'm not an entomologist. And although I'm going to be mentioning birds a little bit later on, I'm not a, an ornithologist either. I'm just a guy with Google <laughs> and a lot of free time, apparently. But this is one of our buddies, uh, the common garden lizard, or maybe not so common. Like I said, I don't know which one this is. There are, I want to say, around 7,500 different varieties of lizard that we could employ to aid us in the garden. And you may notice a few primary distinguishing features about lizards. They all have scaly skin. They're cold-blooded, which means they need large, flat areas like this rock here where they can catch the sun's rays. Rocks are great, by the way, because they can absorb the sun's rays, heat up, and then release that heat slowly. Lizards need that. Uh, they also need a place that they can hide. They can take shelter. Little rock overhangs. Uh, rock wall is perfect. Um, you could use a broken vase. Throwing the vase away, turn it over on its side. Give, let, let that be a place for the lizards to take some shelter. Stacks of rocks and bricks also work. But you give your lizard a place where he can take shelter from his predators, so the, uh, mainly the birds of prey. They're watching down from the treetops, trying to find a nice tasty lizard snack. And uh, provide him a place where he can worm himself up. And the lizard will be happy to go to work for you, devouring ants and other things in the garden. Now, I did mention there are some common characteristics about lizards. Scales, coarse, uh, being cold-blooded, yeah. They like to eat insects, okay. They need that shelter and a place to warm themselves. All good. Not all lizards have legs. Thought you might want to know. There are lizards without legs or lizards with very short legs. Uh, those are called skinks. And there's another variety that I'm going to show you here. This one is called a slow worm. And although it looks like a snake, it's actually a form of lizard. He has eyelids. And if you look over here where my mouse pointer is, Little tiny ear holes. Snakes do not have ear holes and snakes do not have eyelids. So if you see a little brown snake and you see it blink its eyes at you, it's not a snake. It's a slow worm. And slow worms and skinks and that particular variety of lizards uh, have a little bit of a different habit than the, the, than the ones that scurry across the surface of the ground. These ones do travel across the surface of the ground as well, but they also like to burrow into the soil. And while they're burrowing into the soil, Take a wild guess what they like to go after. If you guessed ants, you're right. They love eating ants. As a matter of fact, they're often found in association with ant nests. So here are two great allies for the ladybugs. The lizard stopping those ants as they come across the ground and the slow worm going after the ants where they nest in the soil. The slow worms like to have a little bit of additional help as far as shelter goes. They like uh, herbaceous perennials that come all the way down to the ground cover layer, providing lots of shade, preferably with lots of leaf litter underneath them, keeping it nice and moist. They like to have moist, cool environment to burrow down into. And if you have that, you have a good chance of being able to attract and keep these two helpful warriors to aid your mighty ladybugs in their quest to uh, keep the, the aphids from devouring your plants. Oh, okay. I'm looking at my show notes here. It says there's over 6,000 species. Of lizard. I was off by about 1,500. Who's counting, right? Who's counting? All right. Let me take a look and see what's going on with comments real quick. Say hello to some people. Sorry, I just jumped right on in and didn't say hi to everybody. All right, today we have Mary, we've got Mark, Arkansas Woodcutter, we've got Skippy. Hello, Skippy. Do I know Skippy? We've got Amy from Craze Family Homestead. Voon Cha, hello, Voon. Cajun Hydroponics, how's it going, Danny? Belinda Schneider hates ants. Well, Ants aren't without their advantages and charms either. Uh, if you have an environment that doesn't have a lot of earthworms, the ants do another job of working at burrowing down into the soil, creating channels for 
water and nutrients to follow. They break down organic matter in the primary stages so that the other soil life microbes and et cetera can get to it. So they're not totally without the redeeming qualities, but too many ants or too many ants in the wrong spot can be a pest. So layered predator layers, that's right. The pre predators working in layers and taking advantage of those different layers of, the, of, your, of your food forest. Tin Can Gardener says, we have mean ants here. They can sting. Yeah, I've run afoul of this, um, some fire ants before. <laughs> I don't like it. Don't like them at all. What else we have in here? All right, that's all I see at the moment. Unless I look over here at the, the regular chat. Am I missing anybody? I think that's it. Okay. Let me get back to this. I've got the... Uh, Okay, cool. Came over from David the Good. Right on. Hello, Carl's off the grid. I love David the Good. I keep on saying over and over again, so it's worth repeating one more time. Um, about 90% of everything I know, I, I learned either from somebody else telling me or going off and doing a lot of research, various articles, Google, um, <laughs> Google. Uh, reading articles from university publications and stuff like that. A very, very small portion of what I know are things that I figured out myself, although I have figured out a few things. So, yay, go me. Uh, the picture I've got up here is another ally in the fight against the aphids. That is a hoverfly. It may look like a bee. It may look like a wasp, but that's just done to confuse predators. This little fellow can be attracted to your garden if you have flowers like this one here. What is this? Some sort of aster, dandelion? I don't know. They like bright colored flowers. And I don't know because it's such a close picture of that flower. No, it's not a dandelion. I think it's sort of an aster. They like nice bright colored flowers. Yellows, pinks, and whites. Something that really stands out. And they like open structured flowers because hoverflies don't have long tongues the way uh, uh, butterflies do or hummingbirds with their long long snouts that they can get in there and get to the nectar in, in deep belled flowers. So broad open flowers, uh, dandelions, uh, echinacea, purple cone flowers, things like that. If you have those, and I believe I read somewhere that they like dill as well because it has a whole bunch of tiny little flowers that it can get to. They like to drink nectar. Uh, that's what they do. So as an adult, the hoverfly goes around and pollinates your flowers, but it's the larva of the hoverfly that go out and attack aphids and thrips and little leaf hoppers and leaf biners and things like that. So they'll lay their eggs on the surface of the plant. The eggs will hatch, the larva will go out and they'll find all those little nasty uh, leaf burrowing pests and attack them and make more hoverflies, which provides you with more pollinators. And they're kind of cool. They don't possess stingers and they don't bite, so don't worry. Okay, next up, I've got three different pictures, a little gallery of rogues, so to speak. And you may have seen these guys in your garden and are wondering, well, are they friends? Are they enemies? Are they, should I leave them be or should I get rid of them? Well, the first one here goes by a whole bunch of different names. We call them roly polies. We call them pill bugs, sow bugs, armadillo beetles, wood louse is, I think, I'm not even sure what the proper name for them is. I call them wood lice. These guys are perfectly harmless. They, they eat dead organic matter. They don't attack plants. They don't bite. They don't sting. They're actually not an insect. They're a crustacean. Their closest relative is probably a shrimp. As a matter of fact, there are some places on Earth where I don't know if the, the usual small size like this one is, the, the one that you might see in a, in a terrarium. There are some places on earth where the woodlouse or one of its cousins is actually on the menu for people. I'm personally not that adventurous. I'm not eager to try them, but uh, just know that they're not hurting anything by being in your garden. You can let them be. If anything, they serve as a, a meal for some of your predator species like those uh, lizards and slow worms. So while the lizards and slow worms are not busy gobbling up ants for you, this is one of the one of the prey species that they'll go after and keep themselves fat and sassy on. So don't get rid of your pill bugs. 
you need them to feed your lizards. All right. Oh boy. Now this one, this one's a mixed bag. You may recognize it. It's a cricket. There are a whole bunch of different varieties of cricket, probably about four or 500 at least different varieties of cricket, specifically cricket. Um, there's a difference in se uh, a separation in the classification of crickets and grasshoppers. Grasshoppers, there's a lot more of. Crickets, fewer. Uh, they range from this burrowing cricket here to bush crickets, otherwise known as Katie Dids, which I did at one time have a picture of, but I didn't include it in this slideshow. They're the little green ones with the broad wings on their back. Um, you could hear crickets in the summer, particularly sometimes in the winter if you've got a woodpile, making that chirp, chirp, chirp noise. And eh, some people consider it to be a sign of good luck to have a cricket in your house. There, there's superstitions about killing them off. That chirping noise that they make is only made by the male cricket, not the female, only the male. And he makes that noise by rubbing his legs together and making a scrape, 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 which chirps. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, the idea of rubbing my legs together doesn't sound like anyone would, find it, anyone would find it very sexy. So, well, I guess it works for the cricket, but I don't think it works for us. Crickets are omnivores. They eat a little bit of everything. Uh, they'll eat dead organic matter, mostly dead organic matter. But if they're hungry, they can eat tender young shoots and roots of plants. So whether or not you decide to treat them as a pest or not, that's, uh, that's going to be a matter of personal preference. Uh, Snakes and lizards and slow worms and a whole bunch of other things like to eat crickets. So once again, potential prey species for the predators that you're trying to keep in your garden. That hole there, I don't think is a cricket burrow. <laughs> I think that's something else. All right. Have any, has anybody seen this particular bug and wondered what in the world it is and if it was safe to have around? or safe to touch, or what is that thing? Anyone? <laughs> this particular insect is called a box elder beetle. And as the name indicates, they like box elders. They'll eat the seeds, mainly the seeds. They like to suck the juices out of the developing seeds of box elders and also maples. And they survive also in the, the leaf litter and debris dropped by maple trees and box elder trees. And incidentally, um, sycamore trees like the one I've got out the window over there. Sycamore trees are in that same family as maples. As a matter of fact, you can take a sycamore tree and tap it just like a maple tree, get sweet syrup out of it, condense it down, make sugar. But your box elder beetles primarily feast on box elders and maples, and they will kill off a few seeds of a maple tree. I don't know that this is necessarily a problem because if you've noticed how many seeds maple trees put out, and how many maple seedlings you get if you've got a, a maple tree that's dropping seeds. Having box elder bugs might be a blessing. <laughs> Maybe you'll get fewer of them. Unless, of course, you're planning on picking up the seeds and eating them like we did earlier this year. Although that was silver maple and they're not quite as good as some of the other varieties for eating. But they are a good protein source. The, the seeds, not not the beetles. I, I wouldn't eat these beetles. As a matter of fact, they, uh, they emit a a rather pungent odor and apparently don't taste good either, which is one of the reasons why they don't have a lot of natural predators. During the fall, they like to come into people's houses. And because of that, that bright orange coloration they have, it actually acts as a dye. If you squash them, they'll leave a stain on your floor or on your clothes. So if you have them invading your homes, your best bet is to sweep them up gently without busting their shells if you can, or use a vacuum cleaner and vacuum them up into a bag uh, and then dispose of them, get them out of your house. They'll come into your house the same way that Harlequin uh, Harlequin bugs will, those uh, Asian ladybugs or Asian lady beetle, beetles, if you prefer. And uh, they don't bite. They're just a nuisance whenever they come indoors. Let me see what I've got coming up here. Um, All right, there's that. You jump over here to comments real quick and see what's going on out there. I see we got some more people that joined in. Let's see. Already said hi to Carl. There's John, my cousin John. You just got here. Yeah, David is an awesome teacher. 
plays guitar really well. He's very funny. Writes good books. Good books, get it? Uh, <laughs> matter of fact, I had one of his books around here somewhere. Where is it? Oh, oh yeah. It's, it's not too incredibly dog-eared yet, but there's a copy of Free Plants for Everyone. This is a book written by David the Good on how to propagate plants. It's very simple, easy to understand, easy to follow. As a matter of fact, if you look on page 159 of this book, you'll find the uh, procedure that I used to start sweet potato slips just earlier this week or last week or whenever it was. Hey, <laughs> we got about 12 people in here. It's cool, cool, cool. We have Chris Sunlightner. Hello, Chris. Do I remember? Mark so we says, Do you remember the little yellow flowers we were told the playground joke with? Hang on a second. Let me let me put this up here. Looks like a daisy. Eh, it could be. I'm not sure what kind of, I'm not sure exactly what kind of flower it is. I, I think it's some kind of aster or a, a member of the aster family, which daisies are. Uh, Pocket polys, she says. Amy says her girls call the, uh, the box elder beetle dinosaurs. <laughs> They're freaky looking bugs. Or, or are you talking about the uh, the roly polies? See, this is why I need to keep up with with uh, <laughs> keep up with chat. Bait, Mary says. Yeah, crickets. I, I I don't mind them. I don't mind them. I mean, I I I know that you yeah, have to get old, really really hungry hungry. They might pose a problem. Just keep your seedling starts away from them, and you should be fine. I don't think they're going to do enough damage to establish plants to to make it worthwhile just going out to eradicate them. Okay, so uh, Amy, when you're saying you had those on the side of your house, are you talking about the uh, those box elder bugs? Probably, probably, probably. Hello, Robert Homestead Aquarius. <laughs> They're pretty, Boone says. I guess. I mean, if you like the way bugs look. Hello, Donna J. Griggs. Uh, today we are studying. Predators and prey in the garden, particularly the little things, will never bugs. Skippy says, speaking of asters, we have some beautiful purple asters flowering through. Oh, wow. I bet that was pretty. Roly polies are the, are the dinosaurs. Yeah. They've been around for a long, long time. A long time. Toe bugs in your pockets get eaten by slow worms in your pockets. <laughs> All right, Mary. All right. <laughs> let's let's get back to let's get back to the to the program because we only have oh shoot. We only have so much time. All right. If you're following along on the show notes, I've got a whole bunch of writing about them. I write a lot. So I'm not gonna read all that. Pretty much I just said everything there. So anybody recognize what these guys are right here? These things here. They're round, they're green. They could be white, they could be yellow, but these ones are green. And you'll find these on the underside of leaves, particularly leaves of plants that are going to produce some kind of fruit. It could be, uh, it could be squash, but often it's things like uh, figs or tomatoes, plums. Any kind of fruit. Well, these hatch into these stink bugs. And stink bugs, this one is, I believe, on a fig leaf here, as a matter of fact. Stink bugs like to eat fruit, unripened fruit. So they'll put holes into it before you can get it, which makes them a bit of a pest. We don't like stink bugs. Here's another bug that, oh, okay, you notice how it has that, that sort of broad shoulder and the angular back. This this one's got little wing coverings here, but that, that sort of triangle here going back kind of reminds you a bit of this guy here, 
which of course you may recognize as a squash bug. Um, they both like to exude foul odors to deter predators. Both of these do. But uh, there's a bit of a difference in, uh, in, in, in the way they behave. The squash bug wants to eat the, uh, the leaves of your squash plants. He'll poke a whole bunch of holes in them, or her, she, that they're kind of male and female. Punches a whole bunch of holes in the leaves of your, of your squash plants. And they'll get a, a mottled appearance, sort of speckling on the leaves, whenever you start seeing predation from the squash bugs. And they do this enough, they can bring a squash plant down. Typically, though, they only come out later on in the summer when it starts to get hot. And hopefully your squash plant has done most of its reproductive cycle by the time these bugs appear. In a way, they kind of are like a powdery mildew, which shows up later in the season, usually. But if they come on early, then they're going to be a pest and they're going to have to be dealt with. Now, unfortunately, 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 um, there is a potential ally that can be used to get rid of both this and the stink bug. But since it looks somewhat similar to the to that squash bug, we might be inclined to squish it when we see it because it does look scary and it does kind of look like a squash bug. No, oh, I uh, should probably point out that the main enemy that these guys have, which I don't have a picture of, are uh, parasitic flies and parasitic wasps, which can, first off, get rid of most of these eggs before they hatch. And in the case of parasitic wasps, deposit their eggs somewhere around the thorax of these bugs so that they'll eat them from the inside out when the larvae hatch. But there is another insect predator that attacks squash bugs. And let me get you a picture of them. There's a picture right there. These are called assassin beetles. And assassin beetles, although they have that kind of triangular shape here and or, you know, the broad shoulder triangular shape, you can tell the difference if you look closely. This particular one is often referred to as a wheel bug because although I don't have a picture that shows it, this little tiny strip down on, along the back, whenever you look at it from the side, forms kind of a hump that looks a bit like a wheel poking out of their back. So they get called wheel bugs as well. They're spooky looking, aren't they? Freakish looking creature. And you might go, ooh, eek, a bug, get rid of it. But these ones are actually friendly, although I wouldn't want to be bit by one. And I'll show you why here in a second. Here's another example. There are several thousands of these and they have different appearances, as you can see, sometimes different colorations. This particular one, I got a good picture of this little device right here, which comes out of its mouth parts, comes down. It's hinged in three places, three places it's hinged in. This is called the rostrum. And the rostrum is the, the part of the assassin beetle that uses first to inject its prey with a poison, a paralytic toxin, which also contains an enzyme that digests the inside of its prey and then allows it to slurp the insides right back up, kind of the same way a spider does with its prey. And cat, come on, go answer the phone, cat. Of course, there is a poison here. It's not fatal to humans, but if you get bit by one, it'll sting a bit. It won't feel nice. There is a variety, or basically a cousin, of the assassin beetle that lives down in South America called the kissing bug. And they are notorious for crawling up on people while they're asleep and biting them on the lip and sucking blood because that's what they eat, blood from people while they're asleep. They're attracted to the carbon dioxide from the breath, kind of like um, the way bed bugs are here in, uh, well, I guess everywhere in the world. Yeah. Okay, now I'm itching just thinking about it. Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> but these guys like to hang out on flowers. Also, brightly colored flowers. Maybe nice bright yellow flowers. Nice big bright yellow flowers. Like, I don't know, uh, how about squash flowers? 
You may have seen them around your squash plants. If you did, I hope you didn't flick them off or, 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 or squish them or spray them or something like that because they will help you get rid of all kinds of pests, including squash bugs and stick bugs. There we go. And we'll get to our next pest in just a second. Yeah, phone rings. That's why I put the phone back in there. Okay. Hello. Are you giving me bunny ears while I'm not looking? Oh, cool. Greatly appreciate the bunny ears. We have Mona Bourguin. I'm probably totally mispronouncing that name. Hello there. Let's see. Really please side of the house, box under bugs. Yes, okay. Oh, yeah, I, I whenever whenever I'm 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 scrolling through uh, those pictures, I can't see what's going on in chat, so I have to go back and forth. They're round, they're green, but they're not on the screen? Really? You can't see the... Oh. Sorry about that. Jeez. I forgot to hit share. Okay, so here we go. Those are our... Dirt. <laughs> okay, those are our, our eggs. Stink beetle eggs. There's a stink beetle. There's a squash beetle aforementioned. There's the assassin beetle. And of course, another example of the assassin beetle showing the rostrum here. That's the the uh, the mouth part that's used to deliver the venom and also to uh, slurp up the insides of the prey. Have you guys ever seen Starship Troopers, the movie Starship Troopers? Close to the end of it, there's the brain bug that sucks the guy's brains out. Well, that that little device that that brain bug was using, that's that's a rostrum. So, lo and behold, that's um, it's a real thing. Not the starship trooper bugs, of course, but rostrums. Yeah, yeah, show us. <laughs> It's a good thing. I, it's a good thing I put the show notes up there. That way, if 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 I forget to share the screen, you can follow along. <laughs> okay. There's Mary's Homestead Chronicles. Hi, Mary. Other Mary. All right. <laughs> Throw. Yeah. <laughs> I put I put it in the other room. <laughs> Brilliant film, Skippy said. It's so bad. Would you like to know more? <laughs> Highland will be rolling over in his grave. Oh, all right. I'm going to leave this the the share up while I switch over here. Somebody kept on telling me that I needed to I needed to to to, to blow up my my picture here whenever I'm not actually showing the slides but then i forget so just have to suffer with me being tiny and on the on the side of the screen i guess that way i don't forget what i'm doing all right so now we should be able to see this bug and we're on the topic of insects that like to use strong smells to deter predators and this one is sitting on, I think that might be a hazel leaf. It could be something else. But this particular beetle is called a longhorn. And I believe this one is a European longhorn. And these guys have a range of chemical deterrents from smelling bad to tasting bad to occasionally causing contact dermatitis. So some, of, some varieties could be mistaken for another type of bug, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, key thing to know about longhorns is they like to lay their eggs on vegetation, 
uh, on green wood, and they hatch into larvae, which like to bore into wood, particularly trees. Uh, the larvae can take anywhere from six months to as long as three years to reach their full maturity before they transform into full-size beetles. And if you ever see woodpeckers out tapping away at trees, this is one of the things they're looking for, the larva of longhorn beetles. And there are a whole bunch of different varieties of these. I think there's around 25 or 26,000 different types of longhorn beetles. Um, potentially huge pests. All right, so a critter that they're sometimes mistaken for is this one here. A lot of the time, this particular bug will have really bright colors, particularly around the abdomen, which sort of advertises, hello, I'm toxic. Uh, this one is called a blister beetle, Meloides, I believe is the proper name for them. And blister beetles have a little bit different life cycle than longhorn beetles. Longhorn beetles, of course, lay their eggs on green wood. Larva goes into the wood, burrows in there, sometimes reaching the heartwood and maybe even killing a tree. Blister beetles, on the other hand, like to chew the adult beetle, likes to chew on fresh green vegetation. And for some reason, they seem to have a love for, for members of the nightshade family. So I'll see them on, on tomato plants quite often. Uh, peppers they'll go after. And maybe it's the lycopene that they like because I've seen them eating goji berry leaves as well. A huge infestation from a couple of years ago on goji berries. And I think it was three years ago, maybe four. Anyway, well, a ways back. Goji berries, a whole bunch of them. Now, there's something interesting about the life cycle of the blister beetle. So the blister beetle doesn't lay its eggs on vegetation. It lays its eggs in the soil. And whenever those eggs hatch, the larvae go out and look for food. And although the adult blister beetle is a pest and likes to eat plants, the larvae are predators, and they like to eat grasshopper eggs. And this led me to a really interesting discovery. Let's talk about how the grasshopper likes to, 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 to grow and, and, and spread itself around. They've been around for 250 million years. They've been around, well, for as long as humans have been using plows, longer perhaps. And grasshoppers are attracted to places where there is lots of annual vegetation, nice, soft, tender annual vegetation. There's well over a thousand different types of grasshopper all over the world, at least 50 different specialized diets that they have. That's right, grasshoppers have specific dietary requirements. I mean, yes, if they're hungry, they'll eat anything. But they do have their preferences. And universal to all grasshoppers is a preference for annual vegetation, particularly tender annual vegetation. They serve a role in nature. And the role is to come into places where it's time for things to progress beyond just having temporary annual coverage and having more long-term coverage of things like perennial trees and bushes. And they get rid of the annuals, leaving room for everything else. In that respect, uh, grasshoppers are not necessarily as much of a pest, unless, of course, you're relying upon using your plow to grow lots of tender annual vegetation, in which case they're a huge pest. But grasshoppers like to lay their eggs in the soil, particularly sandy soil, soft soil. And whenever they're in the soil, they become meals for the blister beetle. Well, the larva of the blister beetle. So here's how it works. Step one, you plant a whole bunch of, of tender, leafy, annual vegetation. This attracts grasshoppers. Grasshoppers eat, they get fat, they lay lots of eggs. This attracts the blister beetles who go, ooh, grasshopper eggs. My babies will love this. They come in and they lay their eggs. The next year, the blister beetle larva eat lots of grasshoppers, grasshopper eggs. The blister beetle population exp explodes. The grasshopper population isn't that affected because the grasshoppers laid lots of eggs whenever they had that tender green juicy vegetation. But the following year, all the blister beetles lay lots of eggs and there's not enough grasshopper larva to go around. So the fourth year after the cycle begins, grasshoppers are down, blister beetles are down, and you've got the perfect opportunity for leafy green annual vegetation to take off and grow like mad unless you step in and change that cycle and start introducing perennials. Otherwise, 
you're back to the same thing again, more grasshoppers, more blister beetles, so on and so forth. But I found that that uh, cycle a little bit on the interesting side, and uh, I couldn't really find anyone that had talked about it very much, but it's about a five-year cycle altogether, grasshoppers to blister beetles. So you can stop the cycle by stopping the grasshoppers. Blister beetles, because they cause contact dermatitis. Oh, and I probably ought to mention this for people who are raising livestock. If blister beetles are in your hay or fodder, as few as five, although sometimes as many as 30, but sometimes as few as five blister beetles, even dead in your hay and fodder, can poison your livestock whenever they eat them in the hay and the fodder. And um, if you suspect that maybe your your livestock, your horses, your goats, your sheep, whatever happens, whatever you happen to be raising, has been poisoned by eating blister beetles, uh, first thing you want to do is call a veterinarian and have the veterinarian, if possible, come over right away. Uh, there there is a treatment that can be done to save the animal. Uh, one of the first things in that treatment is administering orally through a feeding tube a slurry of activated charcoal. So if you happen to have activated charcoal, which I will show you how to make later on this year, you can crush that up really fine, make a slurry out of it, force feed it to your animal while the doctor's on the way or while you're taking the animal to the doctor. You can save your animal from dying if you get on top of this quickly. But yes, these things are potentially lethal if ingested. Uh, probably to people too, although I don't really foresee any human eating blister beetles. Probably not. Okay, contact dermatitis. Hazardous ingested, larva destroys grasshopper eggs. Grasshoppers and blister beetles go back and forth in cycles. To stop it, since these guys are toxic, the best way is to attack the grasshopper and get rid of the grasshopper. Now, there are a variety of different parasites that attack grasshoppers, parasitic flies, parasitic wasps. All will attack grasshoppers, put their eggs right there on the back of the thorax, eat through. Uh, there's even a fly that decapitates grasshoppers, which is just crazy. Um, but there are other friends that we can call in to help us out in the fight as well. When I said over a thousand, I lied. There is over 11,000 different species of grasshopper. 11,000. All right. So I'll, I'll just bring this down here and we're getting ready to talk about some friends that can help us deal with grasshoppers. And uh, let me check on, let me check on our, our comments real quick. Told you the cat had the phone. <laughs> okay, Chris is following on, following along on show. Well, that's the reason why I put them out there. Also, I put them out the show notes. I put them out in blog posts about a week ahead of time, if I possibly can. That way, by the time I get around to doing the show, uh, hopefully everybody can just sit back, ask questions, and. Um, And um, yeah, you know where we're at. <laughs> Let's see. Conrad Homestead. Paul says we are guests on Lala Farm tonight. Just got in. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay. So Paul is saying, do assassin bees only eat? only eat other bugs and no plants. They don't eat plants at all. They only eat bugs. If they were all over your pomegranate, they were hunting. Yep. They, they are not a hazard to plants at all. They only, only, only eat bugs. However, because they look an awful lot like, uh, they look an awful lot like um, squash bugs, and there is a variety of stink bug that has that that sort of brown jacket coloration. Um, there is a, there is a variety of stink bug that looks similar as well. So you could double check and make sure that that wasn't one of those particular types of stink bug. I didn't get a picture of those, but I could find one, I guess, and make it available somewhere. Um, if you see that little folding mouth part, the rostrum, you know that you're looking at an assassin beetle. Chris bought a goji last year. We have a few. I don't like them, goji berries. I mean, okay. I know it sounds horrible to say. I I, I don't like the way the fruit tastes. Um, it it it's it's really really 
mineral or maybe vitamin rich. And you, it tastes kind of like you're, you're, you're chewing up a multivitamin whenever you eat them. So I, I know they're good for you. They're loaded with vitamins, lots of vitamin B12 and, and probably healthy to eat. I just don't like the flavor. But I did discover that you can take them and uh, substitute them for tomatoes. If you're going to be cooking tomatoes in something, you can slip that into the dish to give yourself a little vitamin boost. And they're not that bad cooked. Grow something with Jeff. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Mary says, I've been making dirt. Yes, I have. That's, well, that's. I'll show you. I'll show you a handful of it next week. <laughs> but I've been making. I've been making dirt for the, uh, for the uh, the little seedlings that I've got started. Uh, the video where I set up the, the the seed start area should be coming out on Friday, and I can already report that the oregano is starting to sprout. So yay, we're going to have some oregano up and available before too awful long. The dirt that I'm making is. Pretty special. Um, yeah. It's good stuff. Okay, so Amy, when you're talking about nasty looking blisters, um, you've had some experience with, with blister beetles before I take it. Hello, flavors and textures. Sassafras red. Grasshoppers are tasty. I know catfish love them. Shoot. Give me some spare time late in the summer. If I can get down to the river, I'll just grab the pole with a line and a hook on it and nothing else. Go walk out to the bank, snatch the grasshopper, put it on the hook, flip it on into the water, and bam, fish on right away. <laughs> All right. So, yes. The picture that I've got up there on the screen is an orb weaver, orb weaver spider, a garden spider. Uh, somebody might say a tiger stripe or wasp spider, but the, yeah, it's it's an orb weaver. weaver orb, the, I can't talk. An orb weaver, and they're friends. They love to catch well everything from moths to yes, including grasshoppers. If they eat stink bugs. I need some of those. A lot of things eat stink bugs, but usually not. Usually not birds. Um, assassin beetles will eat stink bugs. Parasitic wasps will will lay their larvae on stink bugs to, so the larva will attack the stink bug and get rid of them. Uh, parasitic flies and wasps also like to go after those eggs. And if you see those round eggs on leaves, it's okay to squish those. Uh, I showed you what the ladybug eggs looked like last week, so don't squish ladybug eggs. Don't get the two of them confused. All right, so back to the back to the slideshow. Orb weaver spider, yes, likes eating moths, likes eating grasshoppers. Will eat a few other things too. Um, I know spiders are e e spooky, and I don't like them with the webs across the walk spaces. So I try to encourage them to build their webs somewhere else. I hate walking into a web in the middle of the night, and just having it all over my face. There's a garter snake. Garter snakes, of course, like to, um, they like to eat grasshoppers too, and crickets, and pill bugs, and sometimes ants, and occasionally mollusks, and a few other little things. Yeah, unfortunately, they'll also eat frogs, but uh, garter snakes don't like to go in the water, and frogs can always escape by hopping into the pond. And then we have this fellow here. A praying mantis, and what is that? I'll leave the skies on. Is that a is that a rose, a raspberry, maybe a raspberry leaf? I don't know. Praying mantis, probably the apex predator in the garden. Okay, so snakes like the garter snake and the mantis need some special habitat. Snakes are going to be pretty much happy with the same habitat that you provide for lizards: rock overhangs, a broken vase turned on its side. Uh, maybe some of those ceramic roof tiles, you know, the ones that, that you see on old Spanish houses with that half arch on them, piles of rocks, piles of bricks, a rock wall is good. Um, they'll also appreciate a place where they can get some sun because they're cold-blooded just like the lizards are. So provide habitat. 
for these guys, and you can have these guys. Spiders, of course, just need a place to put their webs up. Snakes require the same sort of things lizards require. And our, our, our apex predator in the garden, the, the, the praying mantis that can kill anything up to and including birds, <laughs> needs dense thickets, hedgerows, things like that. And here we have a picture of an area with some thicket that doesn't have this, its greenery on just yet because it's too early in the year. And there are the egg cases. And out from the egg cases, we have fully formed but still tiny little praying mantises. And because they're tiny, they can be preyed upon by things like, well, <laughs> birds, which makes me wonder, do they hold grudges? And is that the reason why occasionally a, an adult praying mantis might attack and take down a bird? Hmm. Could be. They're also they've also been known to attack fish and <laughs> grab a fish out of a pool and eat it. These guys are voracious and they'll eat anything except your plants. They're perfectly harmless to plants. So if you want to incorporate and bring on the uh, the, the the battle tank of your of your army of anti pest insects, then plant a hedgerow, have a thicket, have a place for these guys to have protection because. They want to have these egg cases de deep down into the thicket where birds can't get to them quite so easily so the young have a chance of surviving. Speaking of birds, there's a bird. Uh, Sespress Red was asking, how invasive are goji? Um, I guess it would really depend upon your climate. They don't appear to be invasive at all. They'll, they'll spread a little bit but at a very slow rate. They seem to grow at a fairly slow rate too. Well, that might also might be because of where I had them planted. They were getting a lot of shade. So they were growing some, but they weren't really taking off and getting huge. But I've removed the shade so they might get bigger quicker now. We'll see. Lori's World. Hi, how are you doing? All right. So what do we have here? That's a Blue Jay. I can't recall exactly which one. Eastern, Western, Blue Jay. Of course, jays are loud. They're obnoxious. They'll come in and run the other birds out of their nests if they can. Uh, this one's pictured on a tree branch eating suet out of a out of a caged bag there. I'm presuming the cage is there to slow squirrels down. I don't know if it'll stop them, but it might slow them a bit. Um, they like to eat nuts in the uh, in the early spring, late in the fall. If you have nuts up in your trees that haven't fallen down yet, blue jays will come along and eat those up. Uh, so I don't shake my pecan trees and I do that so that the birds have something to eat. Blue jays are one of the insect or one of the insects. Uh, blue jays are one of the birds that are known to attack and eat grasshoppers. So if I can encourage a blue jay or two to hang out and eat some grasshoppers for me, I am more than happy to have them. Of course, if you don't want to deal with blue jays, you can always get a chicken or a guinea fowl and have the chicken or guinea fowl run around in the area that you want to eliminate grasshoppers from, and they'll get rid of your grasshoppers really quick, too. In the backyard where uh, our solitary Polynesian jungle fowl, Bert, likes to patrol, we don't have any problems with grasshoppers at all. And also, we don't have any problems with blister beetles because there's nothing for the blister beetles to eat back there. There's no grasshoppers. No grasshoppers means no grasshopper eggs. No grasshopper eggs means no blister beetles. It's a beautiful thing. Of course, if you want to attract birds, all birds, not just blue jays, but all birds are going to require a source of water. So that means bird baths, pools, ponds, some kind of water feature. This is a uh, this is a bluebird that's that's taking a bath in the in in the uh, the bird bath here. And another reason you might want to have water features like bird baths is to provide a source of water for your other creatures that you're trying to attract. Uh, pollinators, bees need to need a place where they can land and get a drink. So if you can put something like rocks, a pile of rocks in the middle of a bird bath to give the bees a place where they can land, 
that would be helpful to them. Of course, that water is going to go somewhere, so it's going to fall on the ground whenever they splash it out. All right. So in addition to food, nesting opportunities, birds require water, all right? But you might be worried if you're going to have pools and you're going to have ponds and you're going to have places where there's water, aren't you going to get these guys too? Of course, you guys recognize what that is, I'm pretty sure. And uh, as I mentioned before, they're not exactly a pest, but they can be an annoyance. Mosquitoes are pollinators. Most of the time they drink nectar. Sometimes the plants that they drink nectar from are plants that might not get pollinated by anything else. So mixed blessing. Uh, we talked last week about ways that you can encourage mosquitoes to go somewhere else in your garden instead of where you're hanging out and how to help disguise yourself and mask your presence from the mosquitoes so they can't find you. But you don't need to worry so much about mosquitoes whenever you have water water features which have active life in them. Um, before I go on too much further, let me expound on that. Uh, there are a lot of things that like to eat mosquito and mosquito larvae, and I'll, I'll detail those in a moment. But also you can put a little fountain or a bubbler into your into your pool or pond or uh, or bird bath and circulating water is not fun for mosquitoes. They prefer still stagnant water. So these areas that you have that have a lot of life and a lot of activity, the mosquitoes aren't going to be attracted to them so much. And don't worry, they'll find places to lay their eggs. <laughs> One leaf turned up with a little bit of water sitting in it. That's enough. Mosquito has a, has a field day. And usually it's going to be someplace where you're not looking. This that I've got here on the screen here, some people might call a mosquito hawk. That's the common name for it. Actually, what it is is a crane fly. And crane flies, or mosquito hawks, if you prefer that term, have been uh, rumored to not be dangerous, to in fact be predators that hunt mosquitoes. And I am sad to inform you that it's not true. Crane flies don't hunt mosquitoes. As a matter of fact, crane flies like to eat plants. <laughs> They're pests. So don't feel bad about, about swatting one. Or if you see uh, if you see a bird sweep by and grab it out of midair and fly away, don't get mad at the bird. The bird's doing you a favor. These guys are not friends. But these guys are. All right. I'll have to check. Uh, Sasperus says, as far as goji berries, I thought they were in the autumn olive family and very invasive. I'll, I'll have to check and see. There are members of uh, Eli, of the of the genus Eliagnus that uh, that aren't invasive. For example, uh, Eliagnus multiflora, the gummy berry, is a nice nitrogen fixing plant. Pioneer species. Well, eh, pioneer ish. Nice edible fruit, uh, and it doesn't spread all out of whack. So I've, I'm growing the Eliagnus multiflora, gummy berry, and I should probably have some seedlings uh, probably the next year, in all actuality. Blue jays. Blue jays are pretty, Voon. They're pretty, but they're obnoxious. I'm not going to sing that out loud because it might be a copyright strike, <laughs> Conrad <I've> said. <laughs> and I can't play it on the, on the guitar whenever I walk into a guitar store. I saw a bluebird in the woods the other day. It was at the right place at the wrong, at the wrong time here. Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the reasons why it's a good idea to put out food for birds. Uh, I like to grow amaranth and just let them go to seed and then leave the seed and the seed head and everything else out there is so that whenever 
we have birds that are making the trip or overwintering, they have some food source that they can eat. And of course, yeah, I can gather some amaranth seeds and, and, and sprout them as microgreens and eat those myself. But as a, as, a, as a cheap and easy means of making sure that my bird allies have food to eat and are inclined to hang around and be there for me come spring, uh, that's a pretty good way to do it. Bird, uh oh, bugs in the bird bath is a bird snack. Yes, they are. As a matter of fact, Mary, I will be talking about bugs in a bird bath being a bird snack a little bit more in a minute. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, not stagnant water. Not stagnant water. Hello, Chicken Johnny. How are you doing tonight? Let's see. What about Daddy Long Legs? Yeah, what about him? <laughs> Charlie, the beta is, feeding, is feeling a little down lately. He hasn't had any live food for a couple of months. Is Charlie living outside, Amy? Sassafras red may need to make more land. <laughs> they take up about uh, six foot spread on the ground. The, the gummy berries do. Six foot spread. They don't take up a lot of space. All the birds around me just steal from my chickens. Aww. All right, let's get back to it. Dragonflies. Of course, dragonflies require water as part of their life cycle. Dragonflies are aerial predators. Probably the best air mobile predators you can have in your air force, I guess you could say. Yeah, they're your air force. They'll snatch bugs right out of midair and they'll do a good job of it too. They'll eat mosquitoes, they'll eat moths, they'll eat flies, they'll eat wasps, they'll eat anything that flies. If it flies, it dies. And the mosquito is your is your, your best aerial predator with the exception of maybe some, some of the wrens, chickadees. Okay, dragonflies are right up there. But they require water as part of the part of their life cycle. Double check and make sure I'm sharing. Okay, I'm still sharing. <laughs> they require water as part of their life cycle. Whether they're dragonflies or damselflies, the little slender ones, you know, the little blue damselflies, both of them have a nymph stage in their life cycle, which can be anywhere from six months to as, as much as three years, or even longer in some cases for the really big ones. And the really big ones, during their nymph stage, they can take on fish and frogs, and all kinds of things in an aquatic environment. Obviously, they will eat mosquito eggs like it's nobody's business, but these guys are great to have, and they're attracted to water features. Not bird baths, but more ponds and pools. They like to have, as you may have noticed, a, a stalk, a stick, or a rush or reed standing up here, that they like to perch on whenever they're 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 posturing for mating purposes. Um, so part of the habitat that you want to provide for dragonflies would be some some aquatic plants that grow close to the shoreline. Um, cattails would be a good example of that. Of course, then there's frogs. Frogs need water as well to lay their eggs and hatch out tadpoles. If you talk to Robert Homestead Aquarius, he can he can show you video after video of how he goes about setting up his garden area to help frogs propagate and grow. And he's got tons of frogs all over the place. This one's kind of interesting. He's got a, if you notice right there, what's that on his back? <laughs> this frog's going to fly on his back, <laughs> hitching a ride. All right. Uh, so frogs are amphibians. They hold their breath for a while, but they can't live in water indefinitely. So make sure you've got a way for the frog to get up, up and out of your pool or pond. Leave a, a branch or a ramp or a, a nice gentle slope going down into the pond so the frogs can get out whenever they need to. They're going to require a little bit of shelter for habitat. So put some water-loving plants along the banks of your of your ponds and pools so the frogs have a place to hide for whenever whenever aerial predators, birds of prey, try to find them. And of course, land predators, they can always just jump into the water to escape from. Frogs will eat ants, frogs will eat moths, frogs will eat all kinds of things in your garden. And there's another bird. This one's an example of a wren.
Da-da-da. Let me look at my notes real quick here. Okay. So wrens are another example of a uh, anti-mosquito bird. Uh, they like to catch insects in midair, but they also like to attack ground dwellers, like ground dwellers, like caterpillars. So they feed those to their to their babies. As adults, they live on a diet of seeds. I mentioned before, I like to plant the amaranth, so the seeds are there for for the wrens and the chickadees and the finches too. Not the finches are that great, but the goldfinch is very pretty. Um, all right. So all of these guys, your birds, chickadees, wrens, and finches. Uh, are smaller birds and blue jays, like we saw earlier, are prone to bully them and run them off of their nests. So the way you prevent that is whenever you're you're setting up habitat for for your small birds, uh, whether you're building or buying birdhouses that are already pre-built, make sure the entrance to the birdhouse is one and an eighth inch in diameter, but no bigger. That's big enough for your wrens, finches, and chickadees to get into, but too small for a blue jay. So the blue jay has to go find accommodations elsewhere, and you can keep a place for your small birds to live. Of course, if you don't want to spend the money on buying a birdhouse and you're not really crafty, you can always grow one with a birdhouse gourd. And probably by next spring, I'll have some birdhouse gourd seeds that I can I can provide for people to grow their own birdhouse material. It's kind of cool. Okay, what do we have here? Oh, we have that. That looks like a that looks like a slug. Let me go catch up on our comments real quick here. Charlie's a house fish. Okay, four year old beta. Ah. All right, frogs eat flies. Yes, except for the one that's sitting right on that guy's back. <laughs> Robert's uploading a tadpole episode now. <laughs> Guilty as charged. I figured you might be. <laughs> okay, so Mary was wondering where frogs go whenever they're not hopping around and whenever it's time for them to, you know, hibernate. Uh, they like to bury themselves in the mud. And they can survive in the mud for a long time. Skippy has to head off, but he'll finish off tomorrow. That's great. Thanks for stopping by, Skippy. Lori hates slugs. I do too. <laughs> slugs are slugs are a problem. I don't like them. Slugs are mollusks. Another mollusk is this fellow here. What is that? A strawberry leaf? Or that looks like sage there. This leaf here looks like sage. That's a snail. Snails and slugs, both mollusks. And they are pests, but the, okay. Nope, I'm giving it away. But we've got Another member of the Air Force that we can bring on to help us deal with them, and that is the thrush. And this is a bluebird, and you may not realize it. Bluebirds are also members of the family of thrushes. Most thrushes live on the ground. Bluebirds live in trees, but they also hunt on the ground. They'll hunt your slugs, they'll hunt your, hunt your snails, and they'll do a good job of cleaning them up for you, along with a few other uh, predators can, can be useful in get, getting rid of slugs and snails. But you may not know this, so I'll tell you. All birds will eat slugs. It's true. Uh, you may have heard somebody say, if you've got a bunch of slugs, you don't have a slug problem. You have a duck deficiency. Well, okay, that's, that's, that, that's cute. But what if you don't want to raise ducks? Well, you don't have to. You can train all of your birds to eat slugs. And they eat, the way is pretty simple. You go to your bird bath, you put a flat rock in the middle of your bird bath flat rock, uh, a brick, something of that nature. You want to do it in the shade because, you know, sun, slugs, not a good combination. So make sure your bird bath is in a shady location. Put a flat rock or a brick in the middle of the bird bath and go pick up your slugs early in the morning. Have trouble finding slugs in the, early in the morning? I've got a simple trick. Very, very easy. Just take a piece of, uh, of, of one by four and lay it out there next to your green leafy plants that are low to the ground, you know, your lettuces, your spinaches, and stuff like that. And in the morning, whenever you come out, grab that wood, turn it over, the slugs will be under because they're hiding whenever the sun comes up. They go for the nearest shelter they can find. Pick up your slugs, put them on top of that rock. 
and then walk away and let your birds have a look at them. And at first, the birds are going to come along and they're going to go to the bird bath like they ordinarily would. They're going to get a drink and they're going to wash themselves and socialize like they ordinarily would. And they're going to look at that rock in the middle of the, the bird bath from this way and from that way. And they're going to hop around it and puzzle at it a little bit, wondering why in the world this is here and what those things are, if they're not a species that ordinarily would go after slugs. And they may act like this for a day or two. But eventually, one of them is going to go, well, I wonder if it's edible. And they're going to pick at it. And after one of your birds has eaten a slug for the first time, they will be hooked and they will go after the slugs wherever they can find them all on their own and your training work is done. They'll even teach their young how to do it. Yep, you can train birds. You can train wild birds. Isn't that cool? <laughs> okay, next up we've got this fellow here. That's a monarch caterpillar. Of course, they, uh, they hatch out into the monarch butterfly. Oh, so pretty. Is that a marigold? I think this is marigold, and and we, we we love maybe not the caterpillar as much, but we we do love the the butterfly, and they're highly prized as pollinators, and and they're pretty, and they they do this migration down to Mexico every year. We're like, oh, it's the butterflies, it's the monarchs, and and, and we got to make sure that we have habitat for them, and got to make sure that we've got, you know, the the milkweed, the butterfly bush, so that the caterpillars have food to eat, and so we can have the monarch butterflies. Okay, that's nice. But not all caterpillars are pretty butterflies waiting to happen. A lot of caterpillars are just pests. <laughs> and we want to get rid of them. So how about some allies to help us get rid of some caterpillars? Well, of course, when I mentioned the wren earlier likes to eat caterpillars. Well, it likes to catch them and feed them to its babies. There's another friend here. Yep, that's a wasp. That's a wasp. And wasps are almost exclusively caterpillar hunters. There's a variety called a mud dauber. It makes a nest out of mud that, that packs up, that actually goes after small spiders primarily. But they also gather caterpillars as well. Paper wasps are almost exclusively caterpillar hunters and are probably the best caterpillar hunters. So they'll go out there, they'll sting a caterpillar, paralyze it with its venom, take it back to its nest, stuff it in a hole, put an egg in there, seal the hole up. And whenever the baby wasp hatches out, the caterpillar is going to be its first meal. And they'll do that all, all summer long, hunting caterpillars for you. Of course, you might not want to have wasps under the eaves of your house. And that's understandable because, you know, wasps can sting. Stings are painful. Sometimes people are allergic. And uh, I don't want to get stung. But there are, there are options. There are solutions. You can build... Uh, special habitat for wasps out away from your house, say next to the garden where the wasps will be hunting caterpillars. That's a nice thing to do. You set up a post, a little shelter shed on the top of it, small thing, put or two across, giving space for the wasps to build a nest out of the elements where they can be protected. That puts them closer to their prey than the eaves of your house. So they're more likely to build there than on your house. Wasps also have another beneficial function in the garden. They're pollinators as well, because although they're hunting down caterpillars and stinging the caterpillars and feeding the caterpillars to their babies, uh, just like hoverflies, which look kind of like wasps, wasps are nectar eaters. So they're running around and they're looking for flowers that they can suck nectar from. And in the process, they're pollinating the flowers. It's kind of odd, actually. We think of honeybees as being this, this really super pollinator. In all actuality, the honeybees do very little pollination compared to everything else. Flies, wasps, hoverflies, um, mosquitoes, solitary bees. There are a bunch of solitary bees that, that, that don't build nests so they don't make honey but they run around and gather nectar and gather pollen and pollinate flowers for us and all of these little critters can use some habitat so here's an example of some habitat that somebody has made and i don't really have a lot of critique or criticism uh for these insect hotels except for one one well one one major problem with these there is one major problem. And the major problem with these two examples of insect hotels that we've got pictures of here, if anybody could take a wild guess. And if you've read the notes, you already know the answer. The answer is, remember our friend, the, the, the woodpeckers? 
the insect eating birds, the ones that like to come along the trees and peck for the larva in the wood. Well, it's not just longhorn beetle larva that they might go after. They can go after larva that are here in the uh, in the wood here or in these little hollow reeds here. That would be uh, parasitic wasps, solitary bee habitat. Of course, that would be masonry bee habitats there. And so if these are exposed, woodpeckers can come along, land right there, grab a hold, and go to work eating your pollinators and your and your, your your insect predators that you were hoping to get for next year. So if you want to stop that from happening, get some hardware cloth and put it over the the front side of your insect hotels. And that will stop the birds from coming in and eating your beneficial insects while they're trying to overwinter. All right. And that actually is the uh, that's that's the, the the end of my my blog post of, of enemies and allies. That was only an hour and fifteen minutes. Hey, we did pretty good. Let me hop over back over here to Streamyard and get big all, all of a sudden and see what's going on. John Derry came in late. Bird training. <laughs> yes. Uh, geese. Probably geese is they're likely to eat your plants. <laughs> ducks may too. Ducks can tear some stuff up. Chickens can tear some stuff up. So having a lot of chickens running around in your garden, if it's a, an annual vegetable garden, may not be a great idea. It's fine to turn them loose in the winter so they can go after bugs in the ground, like the, the June bug larva that like to lay their eggs in the ground. Cutworm larva, which come from a moth, incidentally. Lay their, lay their eggs in the ground, have the, have the pupating stage in the ground. The, uh, uh, I didn't include a picture of one, but the, um, the vine borer moth, kind of a, a black and orange diurnal moth that comes out in the daytime, those larvae will be in the soil. So turning a pack of chickens loose on your garden area during the winter, not necessarily a bad idea. They're going to eat some of your worms, but they'll, they'll eat some of the other bugs too. All caterpillars are beautiful to their mommies. Yes, they are. Okay. <laughs> Love wasps. I hate wasps. I feel you, Paul. I really do. I'm so curious. I love watching the wasp patrol in the garden like, like, like organic Apache helicopters on mission. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sass Persuade is saying, I don't think mud daubers attack people. I'm like the red wasps. So I have those evil ones chase me. Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, wasps have varying levels of intelligence. Um, you can attract all wasps to light if you get a wasp in your house. One way of dealing with it is to get a, a, a jar and get close to the wasps and not with your hand, but like, you know, a book, piece of paper and put the jar over them and then slide the book in between, you know, the jar and then take them outside and then put it down on the ground and then remove the book and step away. And then the wasp eventually will crawl out and it's outside and it can go do its thing outside. Sometimes they do get in the house. Um, but you can shine a bright enough light and you can get the wasp to follow the light. And you can get a wasp to follow a light all the way to the door and then it sees the light outside and it goes outside. So if you ever see a wasp that's sitting there banging against the window trying to get out, it's trying to go into the light. It sees that light and goes, oh, I, that's the light. This is where I want to go. So you can cover up the window from the outside with a, with a shade cloth to shade it or wait until nighttime and then get a flashlight, turn off the other lights in the house, get a flashlight and lure that wasp with the light to the door and out. <laughs> but mud daubers are stupid. You can talk to them all day long and they go, oh, they don't pay a bit of attention. Red paper wasps are stubborn. They don't like to listen. Uh, American bald-faced hornets, the yellow ones, they sometimes call them yellow jackets, but yellow jackets actually live in the ground. The American bald-faced hornet is a very, very smart wasp, and they listen really well. They have short tempers, and you don't want to upset them, but they listen really well. And if you tell them something, they, you don't have to tell them twice, usually. Um, well, no, Mary, actually, 
yeah, okay, yes, yes and no. They do like to live on our front porch, but they didn't they didn't uh they didn't build a nest there this year because you didn't want them to, and I told them to to build their nest elsewhere. And like I said, you don't have to tell them more than once. <laughs> but but honey. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're they're living under the carport now. You didn't seem to mind them under under the carport, so that's where they're at. Okay, Robert says, "Yes, sir. I have a very cool thing coming one day for using wasps on your property. You'll love it. I bet I will." <laughs> it's a woodpecker feeder. Yeah, yeah. If you don't put hardware cloth over your over your over your insect hotels, you you just made a woodpecker feeder. <laughs> I'm the Dr. Doolittle of bugs and birds. Yeah. In D and D terms, I'm a ranger. <laughs> I'm not a specialist. I'm not a specialist. I'm not I'm not an entomologist. I'm not an or ornithologist. I'm not a herpetologist. But uh but wow, aren't they fascinating though? And uh if you look into it, you can you can find a way that you can incorporate using the natural patterns of predators and prey to do great work for you and get rid of pests in your garden. So, hey folks, I want to thank you for coming on and, uh, and joining us here tonight. It's been a great pleasure having, having you with us. And uh, um, yeah, well, that's the show. <laughs> Tune in next week where we'll be talking about the secrets of soil. And if you're interested in the show notes, I already put that blog post up on the website. So go check it out. And thank you for coming, and I will catch you next time.